All righty. Well, good morning to everybody in person and on Zoom. Um, I'm going to start by having y'all do an activity in just a minute. But first, I just wanted to take a minute and remind you of sort of the schedule, everything we have coming up here. Let me scroll down to our little chart. Okay. Um, I still need to grade your myths. Uh, I hope to get to that tomorrow. Um, and then I'll catch up on your uh, explain to the media quizzes as well. Um, so we, <laughs> we are here. And in about a week and a half, we have fall break. At the time of fall break, um, I, for those of you who are new here, I have to do what's called midterm progress reports. And in order to do that and give you an accurate description of how you do in the class, if you didn't change anything, at the time of fall break, I'll go through and put in zeros for anything you don't have turned in. But then once I have midterm reports done, I'll clear them out. But just like for that weekend, you might see it and freak out. So just heads up. <laughs> that, that's what I do to give you an accurate description of if you kept doing not everything in the class, where would your grade end up? Uh, one of the things that uh, I got a question on in the meeting I had this morning was talking about the um, psychology experience credits. So we should be having some studies actually posted on SONA within the next few weeks. I just turned in an IRB myself um, and plan to have another one within the next few weeks as well. Um, but you can also remember do uh, just article reviews as well. Um, and you can do a mix. So let's say you do one study on SONA and then you decide, I'm gonna, I don't like being a guinea pig. You can do the other three as article reviews. Um, these are all due at the end of the semester. So the last day of class. So this is work on your own time, work on your own speed. Um, but I'll try to periodically remind you that these are a thing that's happening <laughs> so that that can help you. Um, other than that, you know, just keep up with your connect stuff and the explain to the media quizzes. Those will also help you prep for um, the exam. Our next exam is not until after fall break. And you'll just based on timing, you're actually going to end up with a whole weekend to get it done. So you'll have plenty of time. All right, any questions about logistics for anything? All righty, so what we're gonna do today to start is an activity. So let me go ahead and put this in slideshow. Um, so everybody should be able to just type this in. Um, actually, real quick, those of you on Zoom, I'll put it in the chat. Um, if you're someone who worries about misspelling stuff, you can also go on Blackboard, click into the link for the Google document and get the link there. Um, this is a brief personality questionnaire and it gives you feedback right away. My guess is it'll take you about 10 minutes or so to fill out. Um, so I'd like everybody to do it so that you kind of see how you would assess your own personality. Uh, I need to stop. One of the many, many things I learned during the pandemic is I cannot talk and type at the same time. So I needed to stop talking for a minute so that I could put the link there. So if you go to Blackboard where the lectures are posted, um, there's a link to this PowerPoint and then you can um, find it in there. Or if you're someone who's fairly decent at just retyping, I thought this was a pretty straightforward link name. There, it looks like an intimidating number of questions, but I promise they won't take very long to answer.
Looks like people are starting to wrap up. We'll give it another couple minutes. And then we'll talk about it briefly. Alrighty, and if you're not quite finished and you want to finish, you can keep doing this while we're talking. Um, but so this was a measure of the big five personality traits that gave you some immediate feedback and folks on zoom you can feel free to unmute or put comments in the chat. What were your reactions to taking this questionnaire and if you got to your responses, did you feel like they were accurate. And again, you don't have to reveal what your responses are unless you want to. So we can just start with, what was it like taking the questionnaire? Was there anything about taking it that surprised you? Okay. <laughs> it asked a lot of the same questions. Yeah, yeah. And that's a common thing that'll be done in these larger personality inventories, particularly to essentially make sure your paying attention and that you're not just like answering five for everyone, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, what else? What about the type of items, questions? Anything about those surprised y'all? I mean, you're pretty savvy people. Some of you I know are like juniors and seniors and so have been here before. Yeah. Yeah, and so the really interesting thing about that, um, kind of going back to the big five, which again is what this is based off of, is um, those are probably trying to pull at openness to experience, interestingly, because one of the things that that's related to is intelligence, although it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we all know plenty of people who might be high in extroversion, but not use SAP words, plenty of introverted people, who might be, you know, low in extroversion and not use SATU or the opposite, right? Yeah, and so I think you pointed out a really important point about these is that, like, where you score on one of these five doesn't necessarily affect where you score on the others. There certainly are patterns that we see, um, but, you know, it can vary. Uh, let's see, Melissa said it made me laugh a little. It <laughs> definitely described my personality well. Not Maybe not exactly, but enough. Yeah, and I think that that's a really important point too when you get to the results is that these traits are dimensional. It's not like you have it or you don't, right? So it's on a spectrum. And so your response, it might give you sort of a, a template, this is what it means, but you might be slightly different than that. And that is totally okay. And that's part of the fun of personality psychology in particular is that we come up with these generalizations, but then we also get to see how they apply in the individual, that ideographic application. Any other responses to your results? Anything surprise you or you think, no, that's just not accurate? I thought it was funny because um, it seemed like they were asking 
some of the questions, how I answered, I didn't think it would take me the response. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and sometimes these are, like, I don't want to say, like, purposely tricky, but, like, written in a way that, like, isn't intuitive, if that makes sense. There's something in um, assessment that we call face validity, and that is, is the item measuring what we would just guess it's measuring? And not all items on personality questionnaires have that, right? Uh, Abby is saying, um, as a certain person with severe mental disorders, personality psychology calls me out. <laughs> yeah, I think it calls all of us out in our own ways. Onyx says it reminds me of those little online quizzes I take with friends for fun. The questions were mildly similar and the results described me decently enough. Yeah, and Onyx, I think that's a really important point is that when we take something like BuzzFeed or Tickle or, you know, used to be Facebook quizzes, um, a lot of times those will pull from stuff like this, right? Uh, sometimes they're super obvious, like with my theories of personality class, I have them guess whether items are from like a, you know, an online quiz or an actual instrument. And some of them are like, how would you decorate your room? <laughs> things like that, right? But some of them, you know, end up being things that could go on one of these. Any other thoughts, comments about doing this? Yeah, so one really interesting thing about the big five is it's not widely accepted yet, but they're starting to find some research showing that where you score on some of these traits does predict how well you'll do in certain job roles, um, much more so than the Myers-Briggs, which is commonly used right now. Um, and so there is some idea that this might be sort of the wave of the future of what we'll talk about later in the semester, industrial organizational psychology in terms of matching people to jobs that are good for them. All right, so I'm gonna skip back ahead to our Freud parts here. We don't have too much more Freud, I promise. Uh, just a couple more slides here. All righty. And so this was the last slide we had covered. I always like to kind of start with that to get us reoriented here. Okay. So again, fixation and regression are typically relative conditions. You're rarely going to fixate or regress totally. It would be like partially essentially. And so each person's personality contains what are called infantilisms, so immature forms of behavior and or predispositions to display childish conduct, particularly when thwarted, when stressed, when overwhelmed. And so Abraham and Kessler were people who really expanded a lot of Freud's work. Abraham as well had a lot of really interesting ideas about depression and suicide um, that he expanded from uh, Freud's work. But they looked at these personality traits depending on whether needs in both portions of, and in particular we're looking at the oral stage, were satisfied or frustrated. And so they said the first half of the oral stage are the sucking needs. This is when kiddos are either nursing or using a bottle, right? Things along those lines. And the second half were biting needs. The idea that um, you are figuring things out through your mouth. You're probably starting to eat solid foods, things along those lines. And so they said you can either have it satisfied uh, or it can be frustrated, not satisfied, and that might lead to some personality issues. So they said, if everything's satisfied in the sucking stage, you're probably gonna be an optimistic person, maybe some dependent traits, uh, but generous, cheerful, sociable, a lot of the things that would go into agreeableness on the questionnaire I'll just took. They said biting, if you don't have anything else in context, right? If you don't also have sucking satisfied, you could end up being sadistic. Um, so optimistic, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, they said if sucking is frustrated, you're gonna be pessimistic, demanding. This might be clingy people, hostile people. 
um, impatient, cruel even, overly talkative, and these might be people who develop anorexia nervosa, or just anorexia, which is a lack of appetite in the context of like a biological disorder. If your biting instinct is frustrated, the idea is that you'd be hostile, envious. I don't know why envious and jealous are both on here because they mean the same thing. Malicious, sarcastic, and it, an example of what you might do to cope would be nail biting. Again, just because you nail bite doesn't mean this, but it was an idea they kind of threw out there. So these are some ideas of what might happen if you were frustrated during the oral stage, according to psychodynamic theorists. But what if you were frustrated during that anal stage, that stage related to potty training? Well, they said that you might end up with the anal compulsive character type. And this is known by a series of traits that are called the anal triad. So these are orderliness and cleanliness. Um, the individual has a need to keep everything clean and in its proper order. Parsimony and stinginess. Uh, they're interested in holding on to things. They're not gonna be someone who's gonna like lend you money. They're not gonna be someone, they're not gonna be a hoarder, but they're not gonna be someone who like donates stuff that they're not using anymore. And then obstinacy, they are stubborn and defiant. So these are the children who refuse to cooperate with toilet training. So this is one side. Um, so again, they called it anal compulsive. It's also been called anal restrictive. The term we use in common language, we're like, oh, that's so anal. That person's so anal. It comes from this, okay? And it refers to sort of this anal compulsive type. There is, however, Another personality type that if you were too indulged during this phase, you might have instead what's called the anal expulsive personality, where you'd be messy and just kind of not care and sort of loose with things. So if anyone's ever seen the movie or the play, The Odd Couple, um, they're a really good example of someone who is anal retentive and someone who's anal expulsive. So one of them is extremely neat and fastidious and like everything must be just so. And the other one is like, nah, let's just like leave stuff everywhere. Um, and, but the one who is the neat freak would show this anal triad basically. Obviously there are some criticisms of psychoanalysis. Um, Freud's theories were really scandalous at the time. Uh, because people just didn't talk about sex openly, like even more so than now. Uh, in addition, this was a time when people were starting to think about like free will. This was sort of following, you know, the French Revolution and the idea of free thought. And if you really look at Freud's theories, they sort of suggest people don't have free will that we're governed by these forces outside of our awareness or control. Um, so some people didn't like the theory because of that reason. But one of the main criticisms was people thought it was overly complex. So one of the goals in making a good theory is to keep it as simple as possible. Um, it's, you know, I think it's called Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one, right? And Freud's theories certainly don't have that, right? A lot of people also criticize that Freud's only method of research was the case study method. Um, part of the problem with that is you can't publish all the details due to confidentiality. Another part of the problem with that is that, um, you know, you can't analyze it, you can't get significance, you can't see trends between different people. Um, his definitions are pretty vague. Usually in science, we want operational definitions that really explain things based on the operations and procedures by which we can measure them and identify them. And like, there's nothing in that, in the id, right? There's no like uh, operational definition of how to measure the id. Um, untestability, you know, 
you there's parts of his theory you can't test at all. There are other parts that it's really hard to disconfirm. And for a theory to be scientific, it needs to contain within itself the potential seeds of its own destruction. Uh, and Freud is just didn't really have that. Um, sexism, again, this was a product of the time, but Freud just sort of thought women were aberrations of men. They were disordered men. Um, Freud thought, for example, the only way for women to get over penis envy was to give birth to a male child, because then they've created a phallus. A little messed up, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Um, and then retrospective bias. So with the exception of a couple kids like little Hans that we talked about previously, Freud largely worked with adults. And so he was asking adults, folks y'all's age, my age, to recall what happened in childhood. And that's what he based these psychosexual stages on. I mean, like sometimes I can't recall what I had for lunch yesterday. And you want me to recall what happened when I was three, right? So like that could be a problem for sure. But again, this is still really influential and he tried to explain everything and that's why we still study him. All right, so now we're gonna talk about a couple of people who came after Freud, who tried to clarify his ideas or like kind of took his basic framework and came up with their own stuff. Um, his true intellectual heir was his daughter, Anna Freud. I've also heard her called Anna, Anna, Anna. Um, and so she was the only um, of his direct children to follow Freud's profession. Um, and the fun thing about Anna is that so part of being a psychoanalyst, like to this day, the vast majority of people who train people in psychoanalysis um, say you have to be analyzed. You have to go through therapy before you start seeing patients so you resolve any issues. Well, when Anna was going through training, there was only one person qualified to psychoanalyze her, and that was her dad. So imagine talking about the Oedipal complex with your father. Yeah, weird, right? So, um, and then like sort of side note again, thinking about the sexism of Freud's time, but also his sexism, um, he kept on looking for who he called his intellectual heir. I mean, he, the, several of the people we're gonna talk about, like Adler and Young, he kept being on like, yes, this man is gonna carry on my work. But really, Anna was there all along and Anna was the one whose theories were closest to her father's. So again, uh, I think he recognized and appreciated her, but never thought of her as like his intellectual heir uh, when in fact she was the one who was. Um, her main contribution was taking Freud's theory and applying it to kids. So Anna did work with kiddos directly. Um, so she brought psychoanalysis into pediatrics, childcare, education, and also family law. So things like custody decisions, things along those lines. So one of the things she developed is what's called a diagnostic profile. Today, we would call this like an intake interview. Um, and it was the first way to standardize that rather than just dive right into therapy. And it was trying to get a complete view of personality function. And it asks things that are pretty standard that we ask today, like family background and personal history. But then of course, also some Freudian things like signs of regression and or fixation. The developmental line is another thing that Anna developed. And this is the idea that there are these id and ego interactions that character, are characterized by a shift from feeling not in control of things, feeling like you don't have control of things to a shift to feeling in self-control or what she would call ego mastery. Um, the lines are pretty psychoanalytic. Uh, they're environmental and interpersonal situations that complement her father's psychosexual stages. So she said, you know, you start with like dependency and you move to emotional self-reliance and sucking to rational eating. 
bedwetting and soiling to bladder and bowel control, irresponsibility to responsibility in body management in particular, um, for the latent stage, play to work. And then the last stage being just totally focused in on yourself to companionship. Another really important thing that Anna pointed out that like seems so obvious to us today, but like no one had taken the time to conceptualize it was the fact that when you're working with kiddos, there are limits to how much the kid can change if they can't change their environment, right? So like if a kid is trying to work through these developmental lines and like become more independent, but their parents are those helicopter parents, right? Um, it's gonna be really hard for the kid unless you can get the parent to change. And again, that seems super obvious to us, but Anna was the first one who said it. Like a whole bunch of other people who came after Freud, she was more interested in the ego. Freud was really into the id and pretty much everyone who came after Freud was like, no, but the ego is the really interesting part. Um, so to understand the unconscious drives of the id, uh, you need to make the ego aware of defense mechanisms. So Freud came up with these ideas of defense mechanisms that ego used to try to keep the id in place. And Anna was the one who characterized them, categorized them, defined them, uh, and said that you can infer them from watching people, from obser observation, from observable behavior. Um, and she also added to some. So Freud's ego defenses were things like repression, kind of shoving stuff down, right? Regression in and of itself was seen as an ego defense mechanism. Um, but Anna added some like identification with the aggressor. And this is one where the victim responds to their captor or aggressor with gratitude and admiration. Um, and this is essentially what we would call in our modern vernacular Stockholm syndrome, right? We see this in prisoners of war. We see this in people who are held hostage. We also see this in people in abusive relationships. All right, another female uh, psychodynamic theorist who uh, again has a pretty good legacy is Carrie Horney. Uh, again, little background about Horney. Um, she was one of the first people, first women to get a medical degree. It was really hard during her lifetime. She was sort of 1900s to get to go to med school. Her father was uh, rich, and so he was essentially able to buy her way in. And there's some evidence that that might have been partially due to guilt because her father horrifically abused her when she was a child. I give that context because without it, people look at Horney's ideas and just think, whoa, <laughs> right? Where did these come from? Because her ideas of the basic start with basic evil. And for it, uh, sorry, Horn, I said that basic evil is what done, what is done to children by their parents. So again, from her own experience, she thought essentially there was a basic evil inside every parent. Um, I think a lot of us would probably disagree, but you can understand from her context. She said parents are indifferent to kids. There's parental selfishness and disrespect. So basic hostility uh, forms in the child, and this is a rage, an internal rage that's activated by experiencing this basic evil. And it's directed at the parents for mistreating or ignoring them. But then Horn, I said, there's a problem because if you're raging at your parents and your parents are the ones providing for you, you're now hating what you need most and that creates a lot of dissonance. You're in a no-win situation. And then she came up with the idea of basic anxiety. And she said, this happens because of the hostility. Um, this is trust versus mistrust, shame, guilt, inferiority. And she said, you need to find a way to compromise. You need to find a way to navigate a world caught between anxiety and hostility. And one of the ways people do that is through what she termed neurotic needs. 
And these are rigid, inflexible, absolutist, infused with hostility. And they're neurotic when they're disproportionate. And one of the things she talked about related to this is the tyranny of the shoulds. The idea that we should, or we must, or we have to do things can be completely overwhelming. So if you just think about the list of things you have to do, right? Homework, uh, working out, maybe clubs, your job, things along those lines, family obligations, right? Horn, I said, if you offer yourself no flexibility on that list of things you have or should or must do, then that is gonna be completely overwhelming. And that's what's gonna to lead to you being neurotic, feeling really needy. Ford, I was also the first person to really bring up a feminine perspective to psychology. Everyone else who'd been theorizing here, you know, she and Anna were sort of contemporaries, but other than that, it had all been men at this point in time and really white, wealthy men. Um, and so she sort of poked fun a little bit at Freud and was like, okay, we don't have penis envy, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, maybe uh, what, maybe you guys have womb envy because we can create life and that's kind of amazing, right? Um, so she said, men and boys might be jealous of the female capacity to bear and nurse children. And she, you know, she was a little jokey about this, but also said, there's some evidence of this in traditions and cultural practices and reactions, right? So in a lot of cultures, there are uh, rituals or cleansings that are done, like when a girl gets a period, for example, um, or taboos, you know, even in our society, we don't really talk about things like menstruation or things along those lines, right? Uh, so there are honest to God, people on the internet who think that people who menstruate can just hold it in at will, <laughs> like, because we don't talk about it, right? Um, and she said that there can also be extremes here where things that women can do are sometimes seen in history as witchcraft, right, and persecution. Um, and she also argued that this comes out in the repeated, uh, striving to deny women equal rights. So what she argued is that women don't have penis envy. She said, my women clients, they don't have penis envy. What they have is they have envy of the man's ability to like do what he wants to do and speak his mind and things along those lines. And as you can imagine, like contemporary feminist psychology really grew out of that perspective in particular. She also talked about women's fear of success. And this is something I think we still see in modern times sometimes where women are sometimes afraid to get promoted or like get a better job because they're afraid they'll lose companionship, they'll lose their relationship, they'll lose friendships. Um, I think we're starting to get over that, but we do see some evidence of that still. So yeah, Horni, really interesting mix of like stuff that we're all like, whoa, and stuff that we're like, huh, maybe she had a point, right? All right, Carl Jung was one of these guys that Freud really thought was gonna be his intellectual heir. The two of them were like two peas in a pod. And then later in life, Jung started doing his own thing, came up with his own theory. And Freud basically, uh, just cut off all communication. They like, didn't talk for the rest of their lives. Uh, so Jung was very into mysticism and Eastern cultures. Jung sort of predates the current uh, movement within psychology to incorporate things like mindfulness and meditation, right? And so based on, he really like, fun fact about Jung that I like knew, but had forgotten until a couple weeks ago is Jung wanted to be an archaeologist, but like being a medical doctor paid the bills and being an archaeologist didn't. Uh, so that kind of plays into this, I think. So he came up with this idea of the collective unconscious. So he said, all humans share this set of memories 
which reside in the unconscious. And these are a sum total of all human experience. And we see this come out in what he called archetypes. And these are core ideas about how people think about the world, both consciously and unconsciously. They're universal themes that come out in things like myths, stories, dreams, arts, uh, books, and modern day films a lot of the time, things along those lines. And so some of the examples of these archetypes are things like the hero, the devil, a supreme being, the earth mother, things that we see over and over in different cultures. And he argued that uh, this collective unconscious was a connection to greater cosmic processes. Some of the other things he talked about here were the persona. And he said the persona is a mask we wear to kind of play the game in society. It's how we sort of hide who we are. Um, it's the role we play. Then he talked about the shadow. And the shadow re represents the unsociable, the taboo, the unacceptable thoughts, the things that Freud would have said are like flown around in the id, right? Um, he said that this is a necessary companion with the persona and that everyone needs a shadow. You're incomplete without it. But he said some of the things that seep out into consciousness and the way we act and like when people do horrible things or when people act like prejudice, for example, he said, that's your shadow coming out. The anima is the feminine archetype. The animus is the masculine archetype. Um, again, sort of thinking about things in sort of a sexist way. Um, they said that the anima is the ability to enter into relationships and the animus is rational and analytical because that's what is masculine. Um, and then the concept of the self. He said the self tries to unify all these other parts, the persona, the shadow, the anima, the animus, and it directs the orderly distribution of the psychic forces. Again, remember Freud was thinking about psychodynamics, forces in the mind. Um, and it's, so it tries to get all the parts of the personality integrated and sort of represented appropriately. He argued that the self was the center or the midpoint of your personality. Again, to me, this feels very much like modern psychotherapies and theories that incorporate the idea of like mindfulness and finding your true self and things along those lines. And he said, development of the self is your life's goal and you don't really start to fully develop it until around middle age, so. All right, rather than dive into humanistic theory and um, only get through a slide or two, let's pick up with humanistic theory on Friday. Um, and then we don't have that much to go over related to that. So we'll wrap up this lecture on Friday. Uh, thanks to Zoom folks for joining us. And thank you to everybody in person. <laughs>